I'm going to um, kind of keep the uh, the presentation on a, a scientific level. Um, first of all, what is magnetic resonance? It's a good question. Um, it's basically it's a non-invasive method to directly detect hydrogen, and it's also applicable to a few other types of um, elements. But hydrogen is the uh, is the main one that we're concerned with in uh, in groundwater and in geophysics. So I've got a single charge on it, a positive charge, and uh, the proton, and it's and it's spinning, and so therefore. Um, it, it acts kind of like a current loop and it, it therefore has sort of a dipole magnetic moment. So uh, most uh, a lot of uh, elements do not have this property. Hydrogen is one that does. Um, so what we're basically doing with uh, magnetic resonance is we're detecting the very small magnetic moment of the hydrogen proton. And it's such a small moment that you can't detect it if there's only one. Uh, you have to have a very large uh, a large number of protons to have any hope of detecting it. But, um, you know, billions and trillions of uh, hydrogen atoms uh, can certainly give you enough of a moment to detect. So uh, the other thing about magnetic resonance is that there's a, it's a sort of a resonant phenomenon. And so the way you detect it is actually by causing an excitation at a particular frequency at which the proton will respond to a, an external magnetic field. And we'll describe that in a couple of slides. But that's basically it. Uh, it's non-invasive. You don't have to touch it. It doesn't have to be contact to, to detect the hydrogen. And another key point is it is not a radioactive technique. It doesn't require a radioactive source. And that's a, um, that's a common uh, misconception about nuclear magnetic resonance because it's got the name, it's got the word nuclear in it. So we sometimes we don't even use the word nuclear. Oh, that's that's the um, scientifically more accepted term, nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. So where let's see, where is magnetic resonance used? Um, originally, it was developed in chemistry in the 1940s. And it's used widely in organic chemistry and pharmaceutical industries and all sorts of uh, applications, uh, basically to map out and um, understand chemical bonds, chem chemical bonds at a, at a molecular level. And uh, I won't get into it here, but if you had a course in uh, uh, mag um, organic chemistry, you may recall this. So you have individual bonds in a particular molecule can cause very slight shifts in the resonant frequency and with a powerful enough uh, magnet and machine you can resolve these um, these different frequency shifts and use them to identify exactly what the compound consists of. Another uh, very widely used uh, application of magnetic resonance is in medicine with medical MRI. In this case you have a you have a a machine that the person you put a person inside of it and uh, the objective is to image the the body so that you can diagnose disease and injury and uh, a third um, widely used is in oil and gas in uh, borehole logging and so that's one of the things we're doing in groundwater so this is not it's not new it's just a different a different field of application to the oil and gas sector So how does it work specifically? Well, you need, first of all, you have to have uh, hydrogen protons. And um, the magnetic moments of a hydrogen proton uh, in general, if in the absence of any sort of external field, will just be randomly oriented. And therefore, the bulk quantity of uh, volume of water or whatever fluid you're trying to detect will not have any magnetic moment. So the first thing you need to do a magnetic resonance measurement is a static magnetic field. In this case, we're, we're using a, a icon of a um, just a bar magnet to sort of uh, give, give an idea of how this works. So if you have a static magnetic field, just like compass needles tend to align in the direction of the North Pole, same thing happens with the hydrogen atoms. So you use a static magnetic field to orient and polarize the water magnetically. So the second thing, the second thing is to get them to rotate. 
So the second step is at one particular frequency, which is directly proportional to the strength of the static field, you have a resonance. That means that the, the water will respond, the hydrogen atoms will respond to an external magnetic field, an alternating magnetic field at that frequency. And they respond by spinning around in phase. So it's kind of like if you had a magnet and you were driving it with a, a some sort of a magnet, kind of like the way an electric motor works. You're driving it with an induction coil and that causes the magnets to physically move in, in phase with that external field. So the hydrogen atoms are rotating around in phase at a particular frequency after the excitation process. And then the third step is to detect. And so basically to detect, you just turn off your exciting field and, you, and these protons will continue to, for some period of time, rotate in phase and that generates a secondary alternating magnetic field that's detected typically by using another induction coil. All right, so that's kind of the uh, the most uh, difficult part of this talk, just trying to get the basics and trying to understand them. So how does this relate? How does the NMR signal relate to a hydrology then? So here on the left, let's say we've got this uh, uh, earth material of some sort. Maybe there's sediments there, but there's water in between in the pore spaces. So the first thing is that the total water content in the volume of investigation, that is whatever the, the particular sensor is sensitive to, the total water content is the NMR signal amplitude is directly and linearly proportional to the total water content. So it's a direct measurement of water content, volumetric water content. And if the medium is fully saturated, then it is a direct measurement of porosity. So that's very interesting on its own, They're very useful. So the second thing about the NMR signals, it's got an initial amplitude, but then it also decays over time. It doesn't continue to rot these spins don't continue to rotate forever after you've excited them. So it turns out the thing that governs that relaxation rate, as we call it, or the decay rate of the detected NMR signal is usually interactions between individual water molecules and poor pore and grain surfaces inside the material. So basically, if you've got water that's in a large pore, these interactions don't happen as regularly and therefore you can have a long signal. The signal NMR signal tends to have a long relaxation time for water in large pores and a fast relaxation time, a short relaxation time for water that's in small pores. So that's how NMR can be used to differentiate between water that is mobile, let's say in um, sands and gravels or large fractures versus water that is immobile. That is, it's in very small uh, pores. Their water's bound by capillary forces or else in clay. So this is basically, uh, if you've got your geologic material like we have here, you've got a combination of large and small pores. There's no natural material that's going to have all the same size pore. You generally have a distribution. So the NMR signal is, is going to be a, a super linear combination of all of these signals, small and short. So you have a typically an NMR signal will have a multi-exponential decay rate that reflects the pore size distribution, or at least the relative pore size distribution. So water that's in really small pores, like this little space here, is going to have a faster relaxation time and water in these bigger pores, larger geometries will contribute a signal that lasts for a longer period of time. And so just by integrating different parts of this curve, so basically here's your here's your model and you can convert your model is basically a, a, pore, a, a relative pore size distribution here. So you can characterize all of the water that's in the short pores, the small pores as being bound just by a, a, applying a cutoff in this time, to, time domain distribution. And so this isn't a direct measurement of bound in mobile water. It's an estimate, but it's, it's based on um, empirical and this understanding of, of 
where those cutoffs happen in different types of material. Finally, you can use this pore size distribution and the some other derivative, NMR measured derivative, such as the amplitude, the porosity, or the mean log of the T2 relaxation to estimate permeability. So this is one, one step further from a direct measurement. It is just an estimate. It's based on a some sort of an empirical model. That's the relation between the NMR signal and hydrology. How do we infer hydrogeological properties from the NMR signal? 